think of something you can ask too. Okay, so we're going to start reviewing this chi-square test for independence. Okay, uh, that's studying the correlation between two categorical variable, and I thought maybe uh, using the printed copy, the display is, I mean, when I record it, right, the quality is a little bit better. I don't know why. Right? Uh, so I'm um, just use this. I'm going to use the, the printed uh, notes. Right? So you get this from the, uh, the lecture video uh, uh, page or the, uh, the DVD. Right? So um, let's see. OK, that's good. So as I say, this chi-square test is for studying correlation between two categorical variables. In fact, uh, this, I should say it's contingency table analysis. So I use contingency table. It can help you to uh, display the joint frequency distribution for a pair of uh, qualitative variable and to understand what's going on, whether there's correlation between them. Of course, uh, sometimes you can split the contingency table right, using additional variables to uh, maybe include possible confounders in the analysis, right? So, uh, but we're going to look at just the, 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 the most simple one, okay? Uh, I'm going to use this example to, exp to review. Right? I think you have probably have all gone through this. That's actually two weeks ago, right? Uh, <clears throat> in uh, Pagano's book, when it talks about uh, analyzing uh, proportion, I mean, category data studying proportion, okay? You learn tests of one proportion, and there's also tests for difference between two proportions, right? Let's say you have two populations, and you want to check the percentage of people who have maybe a, a certain type of disease or not, right? So you can uh, use having disease or not as one variable, and population, uh, one population, two is another variable, and then use a chi-square test to do it, right? You don't really need to use a, a test of difference between proportion because this chi-square test also can be used for that purpose. So, uh, in fact, it's, it's actually it's better to use chi-square test because you can add another category of population. So you can study three population, four population at the same time, right? So it's actually a more powerful uh, tool. So actually, in the lecture, I didn't even mention that, right? That, testing different between two proportions because chi-square test is good, right? So this is an example, actually, uh, uh, for studying correlation between two categorical variables, right? This, uh, this kind of study has been done in the 80s a lot, right? Try to, people try to understand whether there is a, uh, aspirin can help us to prevent heart disease or not. It's a blood thinner, right? So I think nowadays most of people know that. So the study involved uh, 300 people, <coughs> And then uh, 150 of them used placebo, 150 of them used aspirin. And after a period of time, when we observed these, these people, that 50 of them had heart disease and 250 of them had no heart disease. Okay. But if you observe each group, treatment group, placebo group, right, 36 out of 150 had heart disease and aspirin, 14 out of 150. Okay, seems like placebo have higher rate of having heart disease. Right? But this is, does it just happen by coincidence, right? Or this is, there's really something going on there. So uh, what we can do is, as statistical, we can use this chi-square test, right, to help us to check whether the two variables really are correlated with each other or not, right? If they're not correlated with each other, that means there's no really treatment difference. Then we expect a percentage distribution, uh, outcome distribution, I should say, for placebo group, and then aspirin group should be about the same. And so uh, we use this chi-square test for it. And uh, what's the null and alternative? Anytime you're doing hypothesis testing, you procedure-wise, uh, you've got to have a null and alternative hypothesis set up. Okay, so for a situation like this, null hypothesis, since we're studying correlation, right? So the null hypothesis is that there's no correlation, okay? Or no difference in the outcome distribution. For placebo group and aspirin group, the outcome distribution are the same. That means percentage of AS and no, they're the same uh, in the, between these two groups. Okay, and the alternative, of course, is opposite to the null, right? There is correlation. So it's pretty easy to state. Now, when I read your, um, 
grade your assignment paper, I realize a lot of you have trouble stating the hypothesis. So I, I especially try to use those notation. If you're not comfortable with those notation, you don't have to use those mu, whatever, equal, those notation. You don't need to. You just write a phrase, right? A sentence or a phrase to describe the null. Now, for testing mean, now is what? Mean equal to a certain value, alternatives mean greater than or less than. Just write it out instead of using math notation. It, it's fine, right? So, like, in, in this case, you can write the uh, null hypothesis. Be, uh, there's no relation between treatment variable and outcome variable. And alternative, that there is a relation or correlation between treatment and outcome variable. Okay. So if you look at this, this slide here, right, this is original data, okay? And in this slide, actually, I add some information here. Things in the parentheses, these are called expected frequency, right? 36, 14, 14, 136, these are what we actually observed. And then if the null hypothesis is true, if null hypothesis is true means that proportion distribution or outcome distribution for placebo and aspirin should be about the same. If we look at the overall proportion, it's 50 and 250. So for yes and no, having heart disease or not, it's one to five, okay? So if there, there's no correlation, we expect that the actually the outcome distribution for placebo group is also one to five, right? And for aspirin group, also one to five. So among those 150, we can split it into one to five counts, right? One to five, it's like 25 to 125. That's one to five ratio. Same thing for this group, since total is 150. Right, one to five. Okay. If you have instead of having 150, let's say you have 60, then that'll be 10 to 50. Okay. Hope that makes sense. All right. This is a situation that both treatment group are of the same size. This is so-called a kind of balanced design. Right. But um, there might be situation that you don't have 150. You have 100. If you have 100, then this would, I'm sorry, 60. Then this would be 10 to 50. So that's still one to five ratio. Hope that makes sense, right? So these we call them expected cell counts when null hypothesis true, when there's co no correlation. And the 36, 1400, 1436, these are observed cell counts. And the chi-squared test statistic for testing correlation is based on the difference between the observed and the expected frequency. Okay. If the difference of the observed and expected frequency is high, then we believe that there's strong correlation, right? Okay. Does it make sense? All right? Okay. So uh, actually, so you understand how to figure out these expected cell counts. Once you found the total from each column, then if you know the row total, split that row, row total into the same proportion, you'll get that, right? But there's a formula you can follow. That is, uh, if you wish to figure out this this expected cell count for this cell. This cell is on the first row and first column. You just use a row, first row total times first column total divided by grand total. That will give you this number. Okay. This will be the this row for total times this column total divided by grand total. So if, let's say if you have 60 here and you have uh, 50 here, okay, then 60 times 50 divided by whatever total here, you will get that number. Okay. So that's a formula, actually. Uh, the next slide talk about that, right? If you want to figure it out, the expected cell count, right? MI stands for I's row total, NJ stands for J's column total, T's grand total. So if you want to figure out expected cell count from the I's row and J's column, just use the I's row total times J's column total divided by grand total. You get the expected cell count, right? Now, our situation is, is uh, actually uh, simple. It's a two-by-two two table, right? So it's pretty easy to calculate, right? And plus, actually, we have same row total, so actually outcome for both rows are the same, right? Same pattern. And then how do we figure out the difference between the observed and expected frequency? What we do is actually use a difference for each cell, find a difference between observed and expected, like the 36 minus 25. And we square it, okay? Squaring it so that it won't have cancellation, right? So we square it to actually get the absolute difference or actual, actual positive difference. Square that, but divide by expected cell count. You do that for each of those cells. We have four cells, so we do that for all four cells and add them together. That's how we form this chi-square statistic. So it helps us to measure the difference between the observed and expected frequency. Right? 
expected frequency is the expected frequency under null hypothesis, right? So we use the observed evidence and to see how far it is from the null hypothesis. If it is far, then the chi-square score should be high. You're going to accumulate more differences, right? So this chi-square test is like kind of one-sided test. The larger the chi-square score is, the more likely you're going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's a chi-square test, but chi-square test is actually a, a skew and positive distribution. It only takes on positive number. And this distribution has a degrees of freedom. It has one parameter, degrees of freedom. And what is degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom is number of row category. For that row variable, like a treatment, all right, we have two of them, so R is two. Number of column category, I mean, column, uh, number of category for column variable, like outcome variable, we have two, right? Two minus one. So for this particular case, it would be two minus one times two minus one, so that's one. Degrees of freedom for a two by two situation is one. So this chi squared statistic has a degrees of freedom one, right? So this tells you that we could have two by three, four by five, all kinds of possibility that can happen, depends on the variable, the type of variable we have. And such a test is actually a large sample test. When sample sizes get large, such a statistic asymptotically follow a chi-square distribution, right? So when, uh, when you run the software, in some places they may use a term asymptotic, right? That means it's a large sample. And when is, is it, what is, proper condition right, for a large sample. The Cochrane's guideline kind of give us a suggestion what can be considered as a large sample. And that is uh, none of the expected cell count are less than one. Right? So if when we do this study, all the expected cell count are greater than one, so that's good. Okay? And then none, no more than 25% of the expected cell frequency that is less than five. What that mean? We have also totally four cells. If one cell, right, the expected frequency is less than five, that consider one quarter of the cells, right, 25% of the cells. So for a two by two situation, if you observe one cell, it's expected cell count less than five, that will really violate the, the large sample condition, right? We want all of them as the expected cell count greater than five. So that's what the Cochrane's uh, guideline is about large sample, okay? So if that condition satisfied, then we can use a chi-square uh, distribution to evaluate the significance of this evidence, right? And what we do is actually from that chi-square distribution, once you found this score here, you figure the area to the right of it, right? And that's a p-value. This area to the right of it, this would be the, the p-value for the test. Okay, of course, if you have R, command data just produce that for you, okay? So that's uh, really good. Uh, for this particular case, actually, we have 11 uh, 0.616, and then if you look at the chi-square distribution table, this is a chi-square table from uh, Pagano's book. Degrees of freedom one, if you have a chi-square score 3.84, the tail area is 0 0.05, okay? And R is actually 11, so 11 actually out of a range, 11 sub somewhere here. So if you have 10.83 p-value is 0 0.001, if you have 11 p-value even smaller than 0 0.001, all right? So if you try to use the table, right, you see the significance of it. You know the p-value is definitely less than 0 0.001, okay? Of course, we have software, right? That's even better to give you the exact p-value. In this case, the p-value is less than 0.05, so our evidence is statistically significant at 5% level, okay? So that's it, right? It's, it's very simple, right? Okay, so that's uh, one example using... Uh, Studying aspirin, how it, uh, the use of aspirin, how aspirin uh, may be related to taking aspirin may be, may be helpful for reducing uh, chance of heart disease. And often, if you find significant, then people will calculate these, uh, either relative risk of odds ratio, depends on what kind of study you're involving in, right? If this is cohort study, a prospective study, uh, usually people will look at the relative risk, which is ratio of probability of having disease in this case. Right, so the the chance of placebo group to have disease is 36 out of 150. The chance of aspirin group right to have disease is 14 out of 150. Ratio of that is uh, 2.57. This number is a relative risk. Right, you use a ratio of probability of getting disease. Right, so this tells us that uh, if you took placebo and didn't take aspirin, your risk of having heart disease is two more than two times. Right, 2.57 times. 
right, than those who, who did take aspirin. So this is a relative risk statistic. Okay. Hope this makes sense. Then this is a, just another situation. We have not two by two, but two by three. This is a study that we try to evaluate different type of treatment to help people uh, get rid of drug habit. Okay. So uh, first treatment, each treatment we have 24 subjects involved, and first treatment used the cipermin 14 have no relapse, right? And the next two placebo and other treatment actually six and four. No relapse. So it seems like the Superman is doing a better job, but we don't know whether this is by, just by chance, right? So we want to understand the significance of this, so we run a chi square test for independence between two variable, treatment variable and outcome variable, right? Now, this chi square test for independence, there's another name for it. People also call it chi square test for homogeneity. Homogeneity of what? Of distribution. The outcome distribution, are they the same? Okay, so. Again, like I said, this test can be used to compare the uh, difference between proportion between populations. And it can be extended to three groups or four, three population, four population or more, right? And so it's really great. Uh, so the, if you calculate total for no relapse and, and half relapse, 24, 48, right? So it's a one to two ratio. So if, if each group, treatment group of 24, the expected outcome under no hypothesis would be one to two ratio would be eight to 16. So I have eight to 16, right? So in case I have one row treatment group is like a 12, if you want to have one to two ratio, it'll be four to eight, okay? So that's if you don't remember that formula, but you understand the idea, right? That, uh, the equal distribution. So you can use the ratio of the total to figure out how to split this number to get into the expect, to get the expected cell count. Okay, and of course, no hypothesis for this study is there's no treatment difference, right? The outcome distribution are the same, or we say there's no relation, correlation between treatment and outcome. In alternative, of course, there's a correlation between treatment and outcome. And what we do, again, we just measure the difference of each pair, right? Observe and expected within each joint, each cell, a square divided by expected cell count. Do that for all six cells. Okay, so you add them all to all six cells, you get that chi square statistic. Again, the larger the score, the more likely that you're going to reject the non hypothesis, the more extreme the evidence is. Right. In this problem, we have three rows and two columns. Okay, so three minus one times two, two minus one, you get two. So that's the degrees of freedom. You will use that to check the chi square distribution table to figure out the p -E value. Our score is 10.5. Now, if you look at the Chi-square table, this is part of the chi-square table. Degrees of freedom, two. Uh, if you have a chi-square score 9.21, the tail area is 0.01. If it's 13.82, tail area is 0.001. Our score is 10.5 right in between them, so our p-value is between these two numbers, if you use a table, right? If you use a the software, then once you specify the degrees of freedom, you know. You can use Excel to figure that out. But if you have a data, you have the R commander, then R commander <laughs> to just do everything for you. Okay. Hope that makes sense. This is a simple test. Uh, uh, I think for the year that I've been teaching statistics, a student, most of the students think this is the easiest test to learn, right? Then T test or you know whatever test. Right? The concept is easy to grasp. Okay. So I think uh, that's good and. Here is another version of it. It's called Yet's Correcting a uh, Correction uh, Test. Right? What it does is actually uh, correct that uh, difference of observing expected by 0.5. Right? It's correction for continuity. If you remember, uh, you probably studied the uh, normal approximation to binomial, right? In one of the section, uh, you try sometime uh, calculating. Uh, uh, approximate discrete distribution using continuous distribution. Uh, people believe that, you know, may not be as good, right? So they try to uh, do a little adjustment to it, right? And that's the that's reason, right? So usually the outcome is about the same. Okay, so you don't really have to worry about it, but most of the time, if you, if you run the software, software will have the option if you want to take a look at that, right? I think the outcome will be about the same. Amy's concerned that you're not sharing your computer if you're going to use it. Do you want to set that up while you're doing it? Sure, 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 sure. Okay, okay.
Okay, any question about this? All right, so this is a chi-squared test for independence, and later I will show you how to use the, the uh, R commander to run this. Right? It's, it's very simple. And in this situation, this uh, example, the data are already being organized. Right? So uh, you can use an option, create, just create a contingency table, right? and then it has an option for chi-squared test. We'll go over that very quickly. Um, in some study, you may have paired data observed. Your data is categorical, but it's also coming in pair. Right? So when you have paired data, like a situation in pair sample t-test, right? so your data actually is related, correlated. So in a situation like that, how do we actually run the analysis? Okay. And this is a, we, we use, a, we can use a so-called McNamara test for pair sample. Right? So we had a pair sample for quantitative a variable, right? So this is a pair sample test for categorical variable. Now quickly, let's just see an example so it, it'll make sense to you what actually is happening, right? Suppose uh, we are trying to design a program to promote the public health, right? So want more people join public health profession. And so, uh, so before we, so we have a, a sample of individuals. Before uh, we let them see this promotional material, we check, right? What proportion of them interesting profession in the public health profession, right? Then after they view a program, we also do a survey again from the same group of people and ask your opinion. Okay, so this could be one of the results. Okay, before we have 25 say yes, they, they were they're interesting in public health profession, and 19 say no. And then after we have 46 say yes and 98 say no. So it seems like there's an increase, right? Okay. And this nine is before is yes and after is yes. No is before no and after is yes. So we actually change the opinion for 37 of them. But some people may, didn't, may not like the video, actually, just reverse their, their interests, right? So there's 16 of them. So these are actually important numbers, okay, in this contingency table. 9 and 82, these are the people who didn't change their opinion. Okay. So up to the apply the program, these actually shows us something about you know, the effect of the, uh, the program. So we have terms uh, called cord uh, concordant, uh, concordant pairs and a discordant pair. The concordant pair will be this, no changes, right, this diagonal. Discordant pair is this, group, this number on this diagonal. Right. The difference of this actually is how we how we uh, form the test, test statistic, right? So this McNamara test is based on the ratio of, I mean, difference of these two numbers on a discordant pair. Subtract one and divide by the total. Square of that under null hypothesis, right? If we square this, this numerator and divide by R plus S, right, the sum of the discordant pair, this statistic under null hypothesis follow a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom one, okay? So we have a chi-squared test now, right? And I guess uh, it's not too hard for you. This, this is an easy test. Very simple number. Once you have data organized, it's just a difference of the discordant pair. Actually, minus 1, take squared, divide by total, you get 7.55. And again, you look at this chi-squared table, and chi-squared distribution. Your score is over here. You find the area to the right of that. That's a p-value. If that number is small, that means your evidence is actually extreme, right? Extremely far away from no difference, right? The smaller the tail area means the more extreme your evidence is. So if the p-value is less and tail area is less than 0.05, you reject null hypothesis. So in this case, actually, we have a degrees of freedom 1, and our score is 7.5 degrees of freedom 1, 7.5 in between these two numbers. If your score is this, your p-value is 0.01. If your score is 10.8, p-value is 0.001. R is in between them, so the p-value is between those two, again. All right, so you see significant. So this tells us statistically, right, there's a significant correlation between these two variables, the programs, and then the people's opinion. Right? So this is a situation when you have dependent data, we have pairs of observation, <laughs> you can do that. Okay. So this is another chi-squared test, right, but this is actually for paired data. Um, This is, oh, okay, yeah, okay. So maybe let's try, 
the R commander, I see whether we can use R commander to, uh, to do the chi-square test. Right? Uh, in the test, in, the, in our exam, I won't test you actually how you do the McNamara test, right? but I will test you on chi-square test. Right? So make sure you do that. McNamara test actually in my uh, in my instruction page, I have a code for it. So let me do this. Let me just run the R first. Uh, okay. Actually, load package. Good. Okay. Some of you have some problem running R commander. Uh, R commander. Uh, when I saw that message, it seems like uh, it's from a newer version, right? There's still something they need to figure out uh, in R Commander communicating with R, the newer version, right? So it'd be safe you just use my old version, download it from If you do have problems, right? If you see problems, it's always good just go back and download. You can have two, sop two <laughs> copies there, okay? Just two folders, right? Whichever version you like to use, just go in there and click that R, right? it'll, it'll, it'll run. So I'm still using the older version. Uh, so to run the chi-square test, um, you click statistic contingency table, and I don't have data, right? So we can, I can actually, but I have organized data, right, in that contingency table. So I can click contingency table, enter, and analyze two-way table. I right? click on that, and I can just put in those frequency in here, right? If you need the two by three, three columns, just scroll this down, you get this, right? Okay, so you can enter, you can change the number of columns, number of rows, right? So, in our data, we have 36, 114, and uh, 14, and 136. That's easy, right? If you want to report the Percentage distribution row wise or percentage distribution color wise or overall percentage, right? You can check these buttons, right? So I probably you probably interesting row percentage. And then we have a chi square test or independent check. That means it's gonna run a chi square test, right? Or there's a, at the bottom here it has actually so called a Fisher's exact test, right? I can have that checked too. What is Fisher exact test for? Now our data actually is categorical. Right, so the actual distribution for the statistics is supposed to be discrete. Right, chi square is actually approximation. Right? Chi square is a continuous distribution. We use that to approximate the, the sampling distribution of the test. In fact, it has this test statistic has its exact distribution. So Fisher recommend that people use that. Right, and but uh, when, when we have large data, actually Fisher's exact distribution is hard to compute. So that's why we have a chi square option right, to deal with large sample. So if you have a sample size that is small, you check the Cochrane skyline and then you know it doesn't satisfy the large sample condition, then you better off with the Fisher's exact test. Okay. And also uh, if you like to check the expected frequency, you can ask for printing expected frequency. Just to help you to check the, the, uh, the large sample condition. Right? So if I have these check, I click OK, and SPS will give me outcome. We have a P value right there. Right? That's a very small P value, 0 0.00099. Right? That's very small. And also give us an odds ratio statistic. Okay. Um, and odds ratio, this is actually the confidence interval. Right. So I should have something. Yeah, I expect this outcome. Oh, actually, this is Fisher exact, right? And then Pearson's chi squared test has a p value of 0 0.00066. And you have the contingency table. Expected cell count also show there, right? 25, 125, that's what we get there. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's very simple, okay? Uh, you, all you need to do is figure, fill in the information in that contingency table and you can run the analysis. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't have the McNamara test. So if you really want to run the McNamara test, uh, my suggestion, I actually, I never remember all these codes. There are so many codes out there. I never remember them, right? So uh, I always go to uh, check the code, 
Qui parle, mais c'est le message. Go to our commander instruction page. I have the code for McNama test, right? So if you uh, click the R code, right? Here will be the frequency that you want to enter. Okay, like uh, and this this specify how many rows you have. Okay, and this is actually the labeling the table after and before, okay, yes or no, and actually the outcome from this table is this. So this kind of help you to get a sense, if you try to create a data, right, uh, uh, or yeah, enter the data for the contingency table that we have there, right, you can put in there. So our, this is actually really just, uh, let me see, it's for our data, right, let me see, where is my... Yeah, 37. Now, this is just matching our, our example, uh, this particular code. So what you can do is just highlight these. Hi actually, you can highlight the whole thing, because the palm sign is actually it represent a, c a command. Right? So whatever after the palm sign will not be executed. It's not an like R script. Right? Only those without the palm sign. Right? So I can just highlight all these, control, and then put it in either our commander uh, in our commander script window, or you want to put it in the our console. Either way, right? Be good. So I copy and paste it in here, and I just highlight the whole script and click submit. I will get the chi square test, again my chi square test result with the p value, right? And that's the most again. That's really what we want. Right? Anytime you're doing these tests, what really you want is that p value. Okay, so you see the p-value showing you that evidence is significant, right? There is a change, but actually, what kind of change? Is it a good change or bad change? You go back to your table, you know it's good change or bad change, right? In our table, actually, good change is more than bad change, right? So, it's a, so our evidence in, in favor of good change, right? That the program actually helped to increase the number of people who will be interested in, in public health profession. Okay, so actually, I, yeah, I have a code here, right? So you can. For a situation like this, if our commander doesn't have it, you have to find a software or a package. So the package we use uh, actually has this uh, this uh, McNamara test. Okay. So okay. Uh, so that's chi square test. One is for testing independence. One is for testing. Uh, whether there is a correlation when you have dependent of, I mean, we have, we have a paired data, okay? And of course, after you found correlation, uh, you will actually uh, study odds ratio or relative risk, right? And there are confidence interval estimate for odds ratio and relative risk. So in my lecture note, actually, there is a confidence interval estimate formula for odds ratio. Okay, so you have a contingency table. Usually, this is a row variable. This is column variable. Usually, in most of the book, when people are describing uh, the risk factor, right, they, in, in the analysis, they put risk factor as a row variable, right, and outcome as column variable. So A, B, C, D in here is really the joint frequency. You have this many people that are exposed and have disease, exposed to risk factor and disease. This many people are exposed to risk factor and don't have disease. Right. And so odds ratio for, uh, ex uh, for getting disease for exposed versus unexposed is A over B divided by C over D. So we know that. Okay. But we want to get the confidence interval estimate for odds ratio. How do we do that? That's the formula. Okay. If you want to use formula to solve it, okay. In fact, it's related to normal distribution. Okay, log of odds ratio follow approximately normal distribution. Okay, so uh, we actually use a log of odds ratio uh, minus uh, the z score. This z score is related to uh, this. If it's ninety five percent, this is one point nine six. Right, this is really uh, the kind of z score we use when we do an approximation for proportion uh, using z score. And s star is the standard error for log of odds ratio. That's quantity is here. Square root of reciprocal of all these frequency counts in the table. Okay, 
So to solve the uh, confidence interval, you just have to figure out log of odds ratio. Th this log actually is the inverse function of exponential function. When you do the Poisson uh, E, right, that function, this is inverse of that, okay? So uh, once you figure the odds ratio, plug it in here, find the log of that, minus 1.96 is if it's 95 percent, right? That's z score times the standard error. And then the other is plus, all right? Once you find this expression on, on the exponent, apply exponential function to bring it back to the right scale, then you get the confidence interval, right? So for this particular case, actually some people also do the continuation adjustment at, at, at a 0.5, right, when they calculate the standard error. So there's another formula people use that is using this, uh, doing this way. But anyway, if you have a standard error calculator, you have odds ratio calculator, you can plug into that formula, right, that uh, uh, confidence interval formula, plug in odds ratio there. You have 95% to the 1.96. S star is this quantity. Okay. You will get the confidence interval. Yes? Mm -hmm. Is is that whole thing the um, exponent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that whole thing is exponent. Okay. Yeah. When you calculate this, once you calculate this and you take exponential function of that, right, you get the you will get this one point one point eight three. So this is how you do it, right? You have odds ratio, you have that Z score for confidence level when confidence level is given. This is that standard error. So you calculate this whole thing and take exponential function of that, you get one point eight three. Right. And on the other side, you use add, add this, this part, right? You get 5.78. Uh, so this is confidence interval estimate for odds ratio, right? It helps you to estimate the odds ratio. And for odds ratio, there's a magic number, like the relative risk, that is 1, right? If odds ratio is 1, that means regardless you are exposed or not exposed to risk factor, your outcome is the same. And you have a confidence interval that is actually cover a range of number greater than 1, that means your risk factor is significant, right? Right? There's a really significant difference between whether you expose or not expose to the risk factor. Okay. And of course there is an odds ratio formula for McNamara problem too, right? Just just for your reference. I won't test you on that, right? But I thought you know that. Okay. Good. So that's uh, chi square test for independence and also uh, if you recall earlier, we talked about when we, we say that when we do contingency table analysis, we have to be careful. If the data is observational, right, sometimes there may be a contradictory results, okay. Uh, here I have an example, another example. I wonder if I've shown you, uh, no, that, not, not that one. Uh, this is called so-called the Simpsons paradox. Okay, actually, maybe I let me let me talk about this first. Okay, what is Bergson's uh, policy? Okay, so there's a study uh, trying to investigate whether there's a correlation between the circular disease and respiratory disease. Okay, people want to see well if you got the circular disease, a uh, circular disease, are you more likely to get the respiratory disease or not? So, uh, and a lot of time. Uh, when physicians are doing this kind of research, they like to use their patient, right? Their patient is easy, uh, it's more convenient to them. So they collected the, the, the data from, uh, from their patient, uh, 257 of them, and then so they get this joint frequency table. I think you know what this means, right? They, they, they uh, cross-classify the data, whether you have a circulatory disease or not, whether you have a respiratory disease or not, okay? And then so they do a chi-square test and realize, wow, okay, so you have an odds ratio of 3.86 and you have a p-value of 0 0.025. 0 0.025 is less than 0 0.05, so it seems like there is a correlation, right? And if, when you look at the data, it seems like if you have circular disease, more likely you also have a respiratory disease, okay? And is it a good idea just to generalize this? Oh, I, it, this can apply to general population. No, no, that's... That's what, why we mentioned it, and this is in Pagano's book, right? So this is actually a situation that includes not only just the hospital patient, everybody, right? The, those are, the, the previous slides are rec records from those people who are hospitalized. So they're in serious condition. But there are people that are not in that serious condition for both disease. So if you look at the result, actually do the uh, chi-square test, actually you got a p-value that is higher than 0.1, so that means if you look at the general population, that's not the case. Right? So it, it, it's actually 
I think the situation is, the problem is, whether you are in a serious illness or not, right? If you're in terrible condition, you have to be hospitalized, right? Then there may be correlation between the two. You get this, you probably also get that. But, but if you look at the general population, it may not be the case. So you have to be careful right, when, you're, when you're doing contingency table analysis, okay? So patient's condition is actually kind of possible confounder, if you want to say it, right? And this is another situation that it's a, a case in, in California, right, uh, Berkeley area, that uh, there's a, like a sexual discrimination uh, lawsuit, right? People actually believe that when uh, they apply for a graduate program and the female are less likely to be accepted, right, through the admission process. So this is actually a data collected that have 360 people, 360 of men and 200 of women, among them, 286 were admitted and 274 not admitted, right? And among those men, 198 admitted, women 88 admitted. If you look at the percentage of acceptance rate, men 55%, women 44%, okay? So men actually had a higher chance to be accepted, right? If you look at the odds ratio, it's 1.56, okay? But, uh, if you look at another table, we actually split it into different colleges. Right? They have business school and law school. And then you look at a distribution. Male admit, admitted 15%, women 20%. It's the same data, just split it further using the college as a, as a, as a, as a layer, right? One layer to split it. And then look at the law school. Uh, men 75, women actually 80, reverse. Okay, so this is again another evidence telling you that if your data is observational, try not to draw a conclusion so quickly just by looking at all the data, right? There may be other variables that's affecting this, this, this thing here, right? You may not see the real thing, okay? So how do we take care of this? You just have to be careful, right? And look out for a possible confounder. Now, if you want to identify possible confounder that really affect the result or not, right? Uh, you can just sometimes try and error, or sometimes based on your uh, previous knowledge, prior knowledge about, about the data. And then uh, once you found that there's a significant effect, like this one, right, you see that there's a significant difference, and you want to interpret this outcome by some, uh, and summarize the whole information in, and get a one conclusion about this, whether there's a correlation between gender and the mission rates, right? There's a way to do that, right? That, that is called, you don't want to just add them back together and try to get the odds ratio from this table. Right? The odds ratio is still showing the opposite, okay? So there's a way to do this, it's called uh, mental Hensel method, okay? And uh, this is a method that people can use to actually, sometimes people use for meta-analysis, you actually collapse uh, research outcome from different uh, uh, test center, combine them together, and come up come up with one summary statistic. Okay, so what is mental hands or methods about? There, there are three steps involved in my lecture notes, right? And I think in Pagano's book too, right? First thing you would check is whether all the odds ratio, the odds ratio for all the contingency table are the same, right? So we have split that table into two contingency table. And we want to see both contingency will give you the same result or not, right? Or you try to collapse uh, information for different test center. You want to see the outcome are consistent or not, okay? So there's a test for homogeneity of odds ratio. It can help you to check whether all these odds ratio from different sub-contingency are equivalent or close to each other. If they are, then you, you go through the second step. You can combine these contingency table together in a different way, right? you use, use different weights right, to merge them together instead of just add them up. If you add them up, you go back to the original table, which is not something you want, right? And then after that, you summarize those odds ratio into one and test the odds ratio to see whether the odds ratio equal to one or not. You know, if odds ratio equal to one means there's no correlation, right? If odds ratio is significantly different than one, then that, that's a correlation. Now, of course, the formula is ugly, right? Don't worry about the formula. You just need to know that there is a method to do that, and software will take care of that, okay? So this is an example. I have two subtables. Actually, this is for studying whether uh, kids 
uh, a student uh, have enough sleep or not, whether that affect the outcome from a test or not. Right? So in the study, they actually believe that boy and girl behave differently, right? So they didn't collapse the both table together, they just separate them, right? Look at boy, there's a contingent table, girl, there's a contingent table. And you want to summarize this result, right? If you want to summarize the result, you want to see whether you can just use one odds ratio, right? Or uh, one test uh, to actually show whether just there is a correlation between whether you sleep enough and the performance of the, of the of, uh, outcome of the test. So to do that, first of all, we want to test equality of odds ratio, right? There's a test called Breslow Day's test. That's a test for testing homogeneity of odds ratio. Right? So for going through the uh, mental hands of method, first thing you do is that. And then this is an output from a different software, but if you use R, it's the same, right? It's the outcome is the same. So Breslow Day's uh, test give you a p-value of 0.698. That means, well, what should be the null hypothesis for testing this? We're testing whether there's equality of the odds ratios and null hypothesis that there's no difference, right? Odds ratio are equal. Alternative is that there's a difference. So p-value is high means evidence suggests no difference. That's good. That's what we need, right? Odds ratio, no difference. Then we can combine the odds ratio together to come up with a common estimate of odds ratio. So this is a summary odds ratio. Combining two odds ratio tables, you get the overall odds ratio 2.229. So this tells you that if you didn't have enough sleep, right, your chance of failing is, or your odds of failing is two times in those who had enough sleep. Okay, and then also report the confidence interval here. Okay, low and upper confidence interval. And there's a p-value for testing odds ratio equal to one or not, that's 0 0.001. Okay, that's less than 0.05. If you want to test a 5% level of significance, this shows you that there's a significant correlation there. Okay. So this is actually so-called the mental Hensel method, right? We can actually study the correlation between two variables by including one possible confounder, right? And to, to get a summary result. And later on, we're going to learn logistic regression. Right? Logistic regression actually is probably an easier model, easier to use to, to incorporate more than one, several, and including continuous, quantitative and qualitative a, a, a possible confounder right, or predictive variable. So we will look into that uh, next week. Okay, and how do we do this analysis? Uh, I also have the code for it. Right, if you go to my, I think I have the code. Right, <laughs> oh here, sorry, uh, Hensel, uh, mental Hensel test example. Right, and this is the R code. If you click on the R code, this is the whole code for it. Right. So you want to follow this. Again, you want to highlight the whole thing, okay? Copy and paste it to the either R console. So I did it in R commander. We can do it in R console. It would be about the same. Since I'm here, just do it here, right? Save me trouble. So I just copy and paste the whole thing. I think this is for our data. Uh, is that right? Yes, I think so, right? So sleep, yeah. So what you do is just, you can just, Highlight this whole thing, and oh, by the way, you know, I'm running these code, and some of the code require other packages, okay? Because uh, when you install our code in there, you just install some some of the popular and base package, and people keep writing them. So for different purposes, they have different packages you need to include, right? I don't know whether I have included a package in there or not, right? Uh, but uh, if if you run this code, it didn't work. That means you need a package to do that. Right? So let me let me try this. Submit. Okay. Let me see. It doesn't let me do it, right? I think it is recognized. Uh, where is it? So there are packages that are not there. Okay. There are no package called low stats, right? So Law that you need to actually install that. Okay, so what you do? Go back to the R console, click packages. I hope I'm not going too fast. Okay. I use a package law stats, but law stats is not there, so you have to load that. All right. So go back to R console, click packages, install package, and then they ask you to find the mirror side. Usually, I go to US Ohio. Okay, and click OK. OK, 
Okay, then they give me this law stats. So we're going to look for law stats. L A W. Did I miss that? Law stats. Okay, click on that and click OK. So you're going to install that. Okay, I hope that's the only one that we need. Okay, then let's go back to this code again. Click submit. Okay, there's a metaphor package we need. Okay, <laughs> so we go back. Well, when you try to use somebody's code, I actually I can't remember how I did this. I I, I guess I co also copied the code for somewhere. So anytime you're running, you try to do some analysis. Right, that's a great thing of of R. You know, uh, if you try to run some analysis, like you want to run the uh, mental Hansel methods, right? You just go on lab and type mental Hansel and then space and R. You're going to find resources. Actually, they, in, they take you to the code, right? That actually do it. Or say example. You know, people write an example for you. You can copy and paste that, right? But anyway, uh, that's not metaphor, right? So we're going to get the metaphor from our console package, look, uh, install package. Package meta four, right? So you find it. Click OK. OK, good. And let's go back and run it again. I'm going to go from here and back up. OK. OK, yeah. Click submit. Okay, good. Right, so I need those two packages to help me to get this done. So, uh, uh, actually, go back up here. Mr. Chen. Yes. Um, this is Jennifer from Agra. Are we going to need these packages? Because I'm not finding them, or is this just for our own information? Uh, you are not finding them. This package. You mean those two uh, two packages that we just installed? Correct. Okay. So then again, I'm the one that's having all the issues. So okay. Have have okay. Well, uh, usually if you go back to the R console, okay, huh? click on package, and go to install package, okay, you will see a list of all the packages that are available there. And so, okay. you know, you should be able to find that particular package, right? When okay. people are submitting package, they will get the approval first. Uh, from the R community. And then they approve your package, then they will include you. And when they include you, they will put it on the list. Okay. So hope I didn't go too fast, but we have this, fortunately we have this recorded. I hopefully you can follow. But, but if you have any trouble, like was that Jennifer? Yes, that's okay. Me. Okay. Yeah, like you, right? <laughs> You always call me or, or, or give me an email or something, right? or we Skype, right? Anybody, if you have any trouble, feel free to just contact me, okay? Okay. So anyway, from here you see that result, right? This is a, you had the uh, estimate, uh, odds ratio, okay? We saw that, okay? We have the p-value for the test, okay? We also have, actually down here, we also have the, the uh, test of uh, equality of odds ratio, Terence test, okay? That's what this code provides. So you can test what we call your odds ratio here, right? And But what you need to do is go back to that code. You gotta know how where to put in the data. There are places you should put in the frequency, okay? You match this with our example, you will know how this, this is done, okay? So that's cool. That's the, uh, that's the so-called mental Hansel procedure, okay? And you have a hard curve, hard curve to do that. Unfortunately, our commander doesn't have it, right? Most of the people will use the logistic regression. That's a much easier way. Right? But just in case somebody asks you, or you just for some research, you just happen to have this simple case, right? you want to use a, a mental Hansel method, that's, a, that's an option. Okay? Any question? Do you have any question? Okay, if you don't have any question, let's take a 10 minutes break, right? Then we'll come back. Right? 
And if you do have any questions you'd like to ask me during the break, feel free to do so. Yes, somebody is asking a question? Hi, this is Shelly yeah. from Active. Yes. Uh, so what does the name of the package that you installed? The package that I just installed? Okay. Yeah, let, let, let me go back. What's the name? Okay. Now, if you look at the, uh, if you look at my code, right? Actually, this sample code. Uh, let me go down. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, PC. PC. There's a library. If you look at that code, there's a library, law staff. Okay, that's the first package. A L A W S T A T. Okay. What you want to do is actually go to my website, go to that uh, McNamara test page, and look for that. This is actually, oh, that's good, that's good, actually. Okay, so that law stats, okay, that's a package you want to install, first package, okay. Up to the library. When you see, when you're trying to download an example from somebody and you see a library, generally that up to the library is the package name. Okay. When we run our commander, in, in fact, we should type library in our commander, but we can also use a, another, do it in another way in our console, that is click package and low package. That would serve the same purpose as using a library statement, right? So law stats is one package. There's another place. Metaphor, right? M E T A F O R. That's another package you need. Okay, so if you can download these two packages, install these two packages, right? Metaphor. Okay, and uh, law stats. That allow you to use this example right, to help you to to run the mental Hansel method. Okay, you can match this example with the data that I use. Right? Example data I use for the lecture. Try, try to match it, right? If you try to apply to other situation, other application, right? this is a good source code uh, for you to generate the same kind of analysis. Okay, is that good? Dr. Chang, this yeah. is Allison from Cleveland State. Yes, Allison. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so, if you have a different example, is the only thing you have to change um, in the matrix, you see the four different numbers. Yes, yes, that's a place. Yeah, you try to match, you try to match that with your data. Okay. Now this is actually a situation I split into two table. Right. What if you have three tables and you have to change this? Okay. And if you change that, you have to change the dimension a little bit. All right. And change it because you're going to have a three category. Right. But for a, for splitting to two categories, this would be a good example. Just when you have those two contingency tables, try to match this example. You know how to put those frequencies. This is the place you put those frequency in. This is the place you put those frequency in. Okay. You can match this example with your data, right? With that example, I think you can apply it to other cases that has a two by two contingency table and try to split it into two two sub tables. Okay. Yeah, I think I understand. Thanks.
Can you hear me? Yep, Dr. Chang, this is Christine at Cleveland State. Yes. We were just wondering if you could show us how to change the dimensions if we have a larger table. Okay. Which of the numbers do we change? Okay. Now, first of all, you know that the subtable, they all have to be two by two, okay? Then if you want to okay. extend that, uh, if you look at the code, uh, let me see. Let me show you my PC. Okay. Close this. Uh, maybe this is bigger. Uh, you see, here, this part here is setting up a boy matrix, right? For that boy case. And this is a girl case, right? So if you have another table, what you do is generate, you can copy and paste and generate another set of program like this, and of course, for a given variable name for that. So you've got to change this variable name, okay, to that whatever other variable is, okay? And of course, the rest of them will be the same, except for the frequency is going to be different. Okay, so that's the first thing you do. This is generate that boy data, and the print boy matrix is showing you the, actually what you have generated, so help you to double check. So you can copy one, paste one of these, right? So if I go back to my R commander, uh, I will just, after the girl, I'll just copy and paste. Maybe uh, have a, we have a girl boy, another variable, right, called girl boy. Right? That maybe uh, just create another variable. And this is actually printing the other uh, that ma data you generate. And then whatever frequency you have, you just enter them here. Right? I don't know what's that going to be. Right? I'm going just, to just, I'm just going to play with it. All right, suppose and then you change this. Okay, so that you get actually another uh, contingent table in. Then you have a my array, C array, C, you have, well, I haven't tried this yet. I hope this works, all right? But it won't hurt. Let me try. Good boy, matrix, okay? And the dimension usually is row by column by something. Let me change this to three. Either this one is three or the first one is three, okay? And then uh, that's about it. Let me go down to the end. List, my list. Okay, you have girl, boy. Actually, myself, I haven't tested yet, right? So this is the first time I'm testing this. So let me highlight these and then uh, See if I can get our mental hands up. Go down. Let me see if it work. Okay, let's try it around it. Submit. Okay, it work. All right. P value is this, and then uh, you have result for girl boy, result for girl, result for boy, and uh, the odds ratio estimate. Okay. I hope I'm making sense. I just, to do this, you just create another, using, you can use a copy and paste to create another section, right, for, in, for, enter, for entering another contingency table. And then go down my array part, uh, array uh, parenthesis C, and up to C, in that, within that parenthesis, you add another girl boy matrix that's including that new matrix that or new table that you included in and the dimension this is number of row this is number of column and three is actually number of